hi everyone, this is Michael and welcome to the LoveWorks podcast, Dreamers and Doers. This is the special episode number, number 50 that we are bringing you today. We were just reflecting as a team when we first started the podcast last March in the year that we will never forget, 2020. And we launched this podcast in the beginning of a pandemic when we really wanted to create an opportunity to continue to bring great leadership content to our students that we were working with here at LoveWorks. And now we get the opportunity to broadcast great stories all around the world. So again, thank you for tuning in. We definitely know that there's not a shortage of podcasts out there. We always like to remind you that at LoveWorks, we believe that you are never too young to be a dreamer and you are definitely never too old to get started working on that dream. Michael and our hope with dreamer, dreamers and doers is that each week our special guest is going to connect with you wherever you find yourself today. Um, and they're going to inspire you to become the best version of yourself for tomorrow. And I know today's interview is definitely going to inspire you to do better um, and be better for this entire world. No, it definitely is. And if there's one common thread, Carolyn, that we've heard guest after guest, so 49 previous guests, we love to get into some of the habits of our guests. And we believe that uh, good habits are important, of course, as we're growing just in our leadership. We believe at LoveWorks that personal growth definitely can be a blast. And so on this front end of our podcast, we always like to curate different ideas and thoughts that can encourage our students and our listeners to grow in their leadership journey. And so Carolyn, we're going to borrow today's idea and thought from a friend of ours. And it was on the podcast. He's from Oklahoma City and his name is David Skidmore. And he wrote recently in his blog, I just love this idea. He talked about the number one referencing days of the month. And he said that in the year 2021, we're only going to get three months that Monday start off with the number one. February, March, and November. And I just love this thought because he talked about that number one can represent a clean slate. It can represent a fresh start and it's a new month with no mistakes in it yet. <laughs> so we want to talk for just a moment about what we can create from the number one. And maybe this thought and idea can be just the thing, students and listeners, that you need really just to get just get that spark of motivation in you. So Carolyn, do you have one habit? I know you have lots of good habits, but if you had to narrow it down to picking just one that you would want to share this morning, what would it be? Okay, this is going to sound like, I don't know, someone's mom or dad from the past, but my habit is making your bed. And this is something that growing up, I didn't do very frequently um, up until I was maybe in high school. Um, but I, ha I have to tattletale on myself a little bit. I used to be fanatical about making my bed. Like if I had to rush out in the morning, I would probably return home later in the day before I actually had to be home to make my bed because that's how important it was to me. Um, but then during the pandemic, Michael, I, I got out of that habit terribly so. Um, it got to the point where I was like, well, what's the point? <laughs> I'm going to be back in that bed pretty soon. I'm not leaving my house. Like, there's <laughs> what's the point of making this bed? Um, and so, something that I know uh, it really truly does affect me is my mental thought of knowing what I'm going to go home to. Um, mm -hmm. And the rest of the house can be whatever. It can, you know, right now I just moved. So, there's a lot of packing boxes that are out right now. Um, mm -hmm. But as long as that bed is made, I know that I'm going to be coming home to something that feels welcoming and feels like it is something that is kind of rewarding me for the hard work that I go throughout the day. Um, and so, I think of it like that. I'm looking forward to a nice, clean, fresh pressed bed. That's what I'm all about. Um, and so I've gotten just back now into the habit of making my bed again um, and feeling like this is worth it for me. Um, and to know that like I did something really great today, even if it's really small, but for myself. Um, and so that's one of the habits that I encourage people to do just because I think it totally affects the way that when you enter your home again um, and what you have to look forward to. Oh, I like that a lot. I also think about it, My part of my interpretation about it is it's a way to pick up a quick win, right? Mm, Just to yeah. pick off the day. I mean, who knows how you left off the previous day, 
could have been full of victories. It could have it could have been riddled with defeat. Who knows? But to just start that day with a quick win, I, I think is pretty. I think is pretty great to just lead you into next next part of uh, next part of your day. Uh, one habit that I like to, ch- I, you know, we talk a lot about books and music and and blogs and and podcasts. But if I had to narrow mine down just to one, it would be an encouragement students and listeners to journal and really express gratitude and and find the good and whether it's just a quick minute in the morning or if it's a quick minute just before you retire for the day but to just think through just your day think through your life and just to write down just one positive aspect that you can find and i think if we can if we can learn to find the good in the middle of of hard and challenging circumstances you know it definitely could be the launch pad and the springboard you know in our in our leadership journey so there's just a couple quick little hacks from carolyn and i we'd love for you to drop in the chat what is one habit that you currently put into practice that you think is a game changer and uh, we'd love to be able to learn and be inspired by you That brings us to a great time to do our roll call. So if you're out there listening, comment right now. Um, Let us know where you're at, um, maybe what your name is. And um, hey, we've got a fun question of the day. I have to take a drink for this one. Today's question of the day is, do you have a daily water goal? So this is pretty popular, especially at the beginning of the year. People, you know, you, you start talking about, I'm going to start drinking like a gallon of water a day or eight glasses of water a day. And then, you know, we get the really cool water bottles that have little time gauges and everything. Um, Michael, personally, I, I just kind of roll with it. Um, I <laughs> try to stay hydrated throughout the day. Sometimes I think I might think uh, I drink too much too much coffee or juice when, when it should be water, but. <laughs> That's good. Hey, by the way, I absolutely love your water bottle. I have one right over here. You like, you like mine? I like yours. It's very bright. So to answer your question, I, I don't have a sp- specific goal. I know that sounds bad, but I always do have a water bottle in front of me that encourages me to keep dr- drinking water continually throughout the day. Do you happen to have a, a, a goal? I don't have a particular goal. I I do get into it though. When I when I'm really into it, um, and that water bottle is sitting in front of me, I think I can go through like eight of these tall glasses a day, um, which is really fun. I feel really healthy for about a day until I forget. You know, I lose my water bottle again or whichever. But it does a great excuse to get a new one. But uh, <laughs> well, hopefully you're not going to lose the one in particular that you have. And we're going to get into that in just a few minutes. Dreamers and doers, I know that you are ready for us to jump right in. But let's remind you of our format. We are the Dreamers and Doers podcast. And each week we have the real fortunate opportunity to be able to sit down with a dreamer and a doer and hear at least one of their dreams stories. Get to know them a little bit. And also, too, we love to be able to dig in and hear about what were some of the early steps, even perhaps some of the challenges uh, that they that they encountered in the beginning of their journey that it hopes that we really hope that it's going to encourage you to get from the place where you are today to the place that you want to get to tomorrow. In other words, after you hear this story, we hope that you think to yourself, if he can do that, then I certainly can do something big. And to warm you up for today's interview, we have a trivia question and a chance for you to win a prize. And so this is a throwback question. Um, Michael, I think of, you know, are you smarter than a fifth grader? And I think I hear I hear this stat pretty frequently. So this should be a fun one. But on average, how much of the human body is made up of water? So on average, how much of the human body is made up of water? Let's see. The first person who can answer this question question correctly, we will send you a prize directly to your house. Carolyn, lots of questions centered around water. Perhaps that's a hint, hint about something we're getting ready to talk about in just a few minutes. Let's meet our dreamer and doer and find out why his name is special friend Mike Beckham. Mike graduated summa cum laude from the OU Business College in 2003, and he began his career working in the worldwide nonprofit Christian Ministry Crew. Since transitioning to the business world, he has been a part of founding and operating several e-commerce businesses that have cumulatively generated over a billion dollars in revenue. 
Most recently, Mike has served as the CEO and co-founder of Simple Modern. Simple Modern has grown in five years to be one of the leading suppliers of stainless steel insulated drinkware in the world, which is built first on a digital first distribution strategy. Its three largest distribution channels are its website, Amazon and Target. And in addition, Simple Modern is a licensing partner for NFL, NBA, NCAA, and Disney. How cool is that? Hi, Mike. Hey, good morning. How are you guys? Doing well, great to see you, Mike. Do you happen to know anything about these water bottles that Carolyn and I were, were showing off? Absolutely, love love the ones that you guys had. This is this is mine right here. Uh, so I'm the same way. One of the best parts of kind of running a water bottle company is I drink a lot more water than I used to. I'm I'm much better hydrated. So uh, it is it is not unheard of for me to drink like over a uh, hundred ounces or like almost a gallon of water a day. But it's just uh, it's a, a good habit that I've picked up from from always being around water bottles. I like it. So do you happen to just carry yours around with you wherever you go? Or do you have a specific goal each day that you try and that you try and reach? No, I don't have a specific goal. I just I'm, I'm around them all the time. And it's uh, it's turned into to quite a habit. So uh, I, I use it used to be that I didn't get enough water. And, and now I I'll just kind of absentmindedly, you know, drink whenever I'm not almost like, you know, almost like kind of your your kind of subconscious. Uh, habits. And so at this point, I, I think I'm getting plenty, which is which is a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being the conduit to keeping the world uh, better hydrated. Mike, we are again, absolutely thrilled to have you on today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Excited to be with you. So we love to start off our interview with asking this question because we are the Dreamers and Doers um, podcast and every person that we get to interview, we recognize, you know, you're a big dreamer, but you've also done and achieved really great things. But Mike, let's talk about you. What do you feel like you're more naturally? Do you feel like you're more naturally a dreamer or more naturally a doer? Yeah, I think that naturally I'm, I'm a pretty uh, straightforward pragmatist. Um, and so that, that kind of makes me more of a doer that like, I try to kind of see the world as it is, um, and, and work within that. But I, I think that, you know, all really effective leaders have a sense of altruism, a sense of like the way that the world ought to be, or could change to be. Um, and so that's, that's probably how I describe myself. Like I'm very pragmatic, but I ha I definitely have hopes and dreams about how the world can change and how things can look different. Um, but I take, I, I try to take, you know, a pretty straightforward and pragmatic approach about how do you get there? You know, how, how are things today not, and, and let's focus on that and let's focus on making decisions around that uh, instead of getting too caught up or bogged down with how, how we wish they were. Um, but, you know, try and funnel all of the activity and the action towards, you know, building a better future and a different future that looks more like the one that we all want to live in. So I think that's the tension, especially when you're an entrepreneur, having a really clear vision and mission is important. If, if you don't have, uh, if you don't have a, a kind of a North Star about why your uh, company exists and what you're trying to accomplish, then it, everything's more difficult. It's more difficult to recruit people to come and join your team. It's more difficult to lead and, and, and cast vision and motivate your team. Um, but if you're so up in the clouds that you're not able to be realistic about the challenges and, and kind of the terrain that, that you're having to deal with and, and life as it is, it really will hamstring you as a leader. So I, I think that, you know, I love the, the title of uh, Dreamers and Doers because you do have to have some of both. And so um, I think operationally, I'm a doer. I think philosophically, I'm more of a dreamer. And uh, kind of kind of works together. Well, Mike, <laughs> that's good. Take us back to to early childhood, if you if you could. So you just have to rewind the tape just a few years. We're going to get into talking about you know your current company and Simply Modern and and what you're doing today. But we'd love just to learn a little bit about what was life like for you uh, growing up. Yeah, so I grew up in Oklahoma City. I've actually you know traveled. Uh, quite a bit in my life, but I've always lived in Oklahoma. And so uh, and I haven't even lived in that big of an area. I, I grew up in Oklahoma City and then 
Uh, I went to OU and uh, I've lived in Norman ever since. So I've really lived in, in kind of the Oklahoma City me metro area my entire life, even though I've, I've kind of traveled all over the world. But, you know, I, I think I think a couple of big things about my childhood um, have to do with my family structure. My my parents, who I, I think were, were really tremendous parents, and I was very fortunate. Yeah. You know, we don't, we don't choose our parents, but um, it ends up having such an impact on our life. Um, there were two things that my parents did that I think really impacted me. One was um, they, they told us growing up, like, hey, we are committed to each other and we are promising you that we are, we're not going to get divorced. And unfortunately, some of us come from backgrounds where there is divorce or there, there, there are different situations. But knowing that for my parents created, I think, a sense of stability and an understanding about relationships for me that was really helpful going forward in life. As I became older, you know, my father shared with me that he actually, I didn't know this until I was probably 16 or 17. My father shared with me that he'd been divorced before um, he, he was married to my mom, uh, which that was kind of a shock, you know, finding that out kind of closer to adulthood. Um, and it helped make more sense of why they put such an emphasis on that. The other thing is both my parents are in kind of like the, um, the psychology field. You know, my, my mother was a social worker. She worked with kids that have been physically uh, and, uh, and and sexually abused. And my father uh, is a psychologist. And so they really dedicated their lives to helping people um, that had psychological you know, difficulties or trauma. And so the joke I tell people is that, you know, the only difference between me and other people is that I know the names for all my disorders. But I, I do think that the big takeaway that I had from having parents that did that is they, they really clearly told my brother and I, the reason why we've chosen to do the profession that we have is because we want to help people. And we think that is more important than making money. And that message was, was repeated and was clear. And so I had a decidedly middle class, you know, kind of upbringing. Like I remember like in grade school wanting to get the new Nike shoes and I was wearing the Walmart shoes and I was kind of insecure about that. And so, um, but that's kind of my background. So I, I came from this background where, um, helping people was lifted up and above material possessions uh, and where, you know, relation being relationally committed was lifted up. And those two things, I think, have tremendously shaped my life and, and the way that I think about the world and interact with people today. That's huge. I mean, just hearing that, how the intentionality of of those two big pillars, right? It's helping people, but also the, the committed side of it. Um, it's great to hear, uh, helps me. I'm not, <laughs> I don't have kids yet, but um, it's something that that is honestly um, very helpful to hear. I, I think but, kids is a threat because you really, I, I've learned this over the last few years, you reinterpret your childhood. You, It's like you almost live back through your childhood and rethink through things that you've experienced and you see them through new eyes now that you're a parent. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I can totally relate. It's, it's been really interesting for me, even as we've had kids, I have a better understanding of like my childhood now that I've been a parent, ironically. Mm. Or, so let's, let's sit a little bit more in that, in the childhood side of it. Um, you know, your parents made it very apparent, you know, you helping people is a, a huge priority. How did the entrepreneurship side kind of come in here? Were you always entrepreneurial or did that kind of come later for you in life? I mean, I think there were hints of it, but I certainly did not think of myself as an entrepreneur. Um, and th there, there wasn't like, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs are like, I had an uncle or a parent or, you know, somebody that in, in the family that I, I kind of, I grew up around their business. We didn't have anything like that. Um, and, and ironically, my brother and I have both turned into um, fairly seasoned entrepreneurs, but that was, there wasn't really anything in our family that would have made you think you know, think that that was, that was the case. In fact, you know, if you kind of look at growing up, uh, I think you could have seen more of the signs of my brother than me. Um, he was, he was kind of always looking for an angle of, you know, like, how could I turn this into a business or how could I sell something? Um, a lot more than I was. Uh, so there, there weren't, there weren't a lot of obvious things early on. And one of the, it's in retrospect, one of the first things that I think was indicative that, that I had a kind of an entrepreneurial streak. When I was in high school, I was uh, I went to PC North High School and I was elected treasurer of the student body, like student council. 
And I had this idea to raise money. Um, and the idea was, I'm going to convince the school to, we had a parking lot and parking was, uh, you know, a disaster at our high school. And I thought, I'm going to convince the school to, to allow me to sell the best parking spots. And I was able to convince the school to allow me to sell, like to, to reserve and sell the best. And, and then even the way that I sold them was pretty creative because, you know, I thought there'll be a lot of demand for these spots. So I did a silent auction. There was like a period of time where you could just say, here's what I'm willing to pay for one and people would submit and then we'd let you know. And so, and, and it ended up being like really successful. And, and it's something uh, even today, you know, sometimes when I drive by my, uh, my old high school, I'll, I'll look and, and the spots are still there and it's still happening today. So that, that might've been one of the first entrepreneurial things I did, but um, I, I think uh, I'm a little bit of a late bloomer in that uh, the, the entrepreneurial spirit probably came out later. I will say when I when I went into the ministry world, I learned that uh, working with crew that there, there was a lot about the ministry world that was very entrepreneurial. I just didn't understand that at the time. I did, you know, my, my paradigm was entrepreneurship is about starting a business. And what I realize now is that entrepreneurship is about this mindset of how do you how do you create things from nothing and how do you make do with smaller amounts of resources and how are you. Um, creative and, and exercising ingenuity in these things. And once I started to realize that, I realized, well, hey, there's a lot of areas in my life where I've actually been entrepreneurial um, over the years. I just I just didn't identify it as that at the time. Mm -hmm. Mike, that is quite the unconventional take on the lemonade stand. Yes, yes, it was. It, it, uh, and I, ironically, you know, I ended up later being a part of starting an auction business. Uh, and so it, that's especially ironic uh, in line of the, the, the high school story. Well, I'll talk about a carryover of other things from your from your childhood. You mentioned one of the key values and, and we, we use the word pillars, you know, from your from your parents were along the lines of helping people. And so you briefly just mentioned being a part of crew. So you tell us a little bit about about that part of your life. Uh, working with crew, but then you made a crossover from the nonprofit world to the for-profit world. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, just to kind of fill in the gaps, uh, in I, I went to OU uh, on a scholarship called the Regent Scholarship, um, and it it would pay for your school for five years, basically, which is incredible. And uh, I was not motivated to get done in quicker than five years, we'll say. Like I met my wife in college and she got a bachelor's and a master's in five years and I just got a bachelor's. So she kind of laughed me. She, she got two degrees in the same time it took me to get one. Um, but if you take the five years I was call in college and you cut it right down the middle, um, the, the big life event was I became a Christian and it really changed, you know, changed my perspectives, my worldview and a, a bunch of different things. The other thing that happened in college is I was a finance major and I'd always been pretty good at school, but finance was just like far and away the, that came the most naturally of anything that I that I'd ever done. And so I, I just thought I'm going to graduate. I'm going to go and work in the marketplace. And then hopefully, you know, I can I can give really generously to some worthy causes. And I think that that's how I want to kind of impact the world. And the, the way it worked out, my wife and I got married We were and, and there was kind of a gap year almost where she was still going to be in school. She needed to be in kind of the Norman area. And somebody challenged me like, Hey, would you consider doing a one year internship in, in the ministry world? And I had really thought like I was going to, you know, go and work in the business world. But I said, no, that, that sounds interesting. I'll consider it. Mm -hmm. And one year turned into two which turned into to nine. And I kind of looked up and I was 30 and I had loved, I had loved the nonprofit world. I mean, I think that there are different jobs pull out different parts of our personalities. And for me, working in the nonprofit world where my job was really caring for other people and pouring into other people uh, brought out some of the best of me, I think. And so I got to 30 and it's like, well, you know, I guess I'm never going to do the finance PhD that I thought. I guess I'm not you know, going to go be working in the marketplace. And that's OK. You know, I really enjoy focusing on people and kind of pouring into people. And then ironically, right around that period is when my brother uh, approached me about starting a business with him. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in 2009, uh, my, I, was, I was leading a ministry, uh, but also my brother had had a lot of success in the marketing world, but he wanted to start a company. And he approached me and said, hey, will you help me do this? And I said, OK, I, you know, I'm looking for something like I feel like I've got some capacity for kind of a side, uh, a side thing to, to put attention towards. 
and helped him recruit some some friends of ours, some mutual friends of ours to, to kind of be the initial team. And we launched that business, uh, which was called Quibids in like uh, October of 2009. In, in the first year, that business went from not existing to having a million dollar revenue day. Um, and so it, it was just kind of this wild experience. It was kind of the definition of the inmates running the asylum <laughs> where I was the oldest person associated with the company. It's kind of like, you know, like the T, you know, the, the, the social network, you know, like we're just, it's a bunch of kids and we don't really totally know what we're doing, but we have way more success than we, than we should be with what we're working on. And, um, so I kind of got to the point and then we got, we got pregnant with our first child and I was kind of really wanted to be a great parent. Um, and I was kind of, uh, riding two horses at once. I, I really had kind of two full-time jobs and I had, uh, a new son and felt like, okay, I need to make a decision here. And I ended up feeling like, you know, in talking with my wife and, and other people that the calling was for me to move into uh, the business world. So that really happened in about 2012 that I full-time moved into the business world. Uh, and that's where I've been uh, over the last 10 years or so. Wow. Mike, if you don't mind, you, you know, use the word calling. And I would imagine, sure. I mean, it, it, it sounds like you had a tremendous nine years with crew and of course, you start your first company and you talk with us about just the su success of that. How challenging was it, you know, in, in that season to be able to, to pull away from the nonprofit and your company and then to look ahead at starting another new business? Yeah. So, you know, Simple Modern, which is the, the company that I run today, um, has been kind of a gradual building process. But initially it was extremely challenging for me to move away from the nonprofit world, partially because um, our community was there uh, and because from a, from a purpose perspective, it's just, it was so easy to feel good about how I was investing my days, you know? Uh, whereas in the business world, there's some days where I feel like I get a lot done, but it's like, man, you know, like what, what did I accomplish that has kind of long-term meaningful value? And so for me, there's been this process of reconciling the two worlds and understanding how to make, you know, entrepreneurship and for-profit business, um, you know, in my view, kind of redemptive and, and a part of, you know, improving people's lives. And so like the, the, if you look at my career, I, I had this first section where it was nonprofit, you know, ministry focused, very people focused. And then I had several years of working with my brother in very high growth kind of digital e-commerce uh, company. And what I would describe simple modern is the kind of fusion of those two things that those two experiences were extremely formative for me. And I kind of said, you know, what if we took the best parts of being a part of, you know, a, a, a nonprofit ministry team and the mission and purpose, but you kind of combine that with the desire to, to create excellent things and um, have amazing products and serve a lot of customers and be able to have, a, you know, a, a large impact in the marketplace and through finances. And what if you put that all together? What would that look like? And, and my best attempt at an answer to that is Simple Modern. I love that. And I, I think you, I love, you know, you share it's a fusion of, of both worlds and you see it even when you log on to the Simple Modern website, it gives you a little bit of a different vibe than we're just trying to sell you something. <laughs> we're yeah. really trying to create connections. Well, um, a, lot of, a lot of brands, just to, to, to kind of interject there, you know, brands are this kind of idea of an aspirational lifestyle, right? And like even in our product category, like if you think of we've got some really great, you know, other brands in our category, like Yeti's a good example. It's built around this idea of like the aspirational lifestyle is getting outdoors and doing outdoorsy things. And I think the thing that we're trying to create with our brand, which is a little bit different, is not so much this aspirational aspirational lifestyle of, oh, people view you as, you know, being really luxurious or that you're doing these adventurous things or, you know, like you're, you're spending time outdoors, you know, whatever else. But that the aspirate, like instead, it's kind of uh, a brand built around attitudes and kind of who you are uh, internally. And that's what we're trying to do is really build a brand around these ideas of generosity and, and excellence and more kind of who you are on a character level than like what it is that you do. And 
Uh, so anyway, that's like you said, we're, we're trying to give a different vibe and I'm glad that comes through. For sure, for sure. Um, so I, I want to point this out, you know, every single bottle um, has a label that says we exist to give back. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And, you know, where does this go to? Sure. So the we've actually simplified that even more. Our, our company mission statement is simply we exist to give generously. That from the very from very early on, when I uh, I'll even go back to when I went into the ministry from the ministry world into the for profit world, I explicitly wanted to start a foundation that was focused on giving. That was the idea from the very beginning, and that has certainly been a part of the thought process with Simple Modern. When we started Simple Modern, I was at a little bit of a crossroads where financially I probably could have done a lot of different things. But I thought if I'm going to stay in the business world, I want to stay in the business world because of the ability to make an impact in customers' lives and to give financially. And so we really had that idea from, from day one, that we want to build a generous company. And I think if you take a step back right now, our culture is kind of wrestling with some aspects of capitalism and really it's wrestling with the fact that there, there has been a prevalent, you know, attitude of kind of greed or, you know, and if, if I'm able to get a lot of money, it's all for me. And we really reject that idea. Like we're very much capitalistic. We're very much entrepreneurial, but we believe that there's a real responsibility, you know, when you are entrusted with a lot of resources to be generous and, and to be a part of making positive change. So we've had that perspective really from day one. One of the ways we put that into action right off the bat with Simple Modern is we said, okay, 10% of profits are just, there. we're going we're gonna to give them away no matter what. Um, I think over and above that on a personal level, I know that all the owners have much higher standards for giving even than that. Um, and we don't, we don't publicize that, but it's it, from an attitude perspective, that's, that's the way that we, we approach it. But I'll tell I'll tell one story about the giving and then I'll give you some examples of the organizations. You know, last year um, in March, right about now, we were starting to see the kind of stay at home orders with coronavirus and stuff like that. And one of the things our teams noticed was that there was just a lot of need. You know, there were a lot of people that were losing their jobs. There were a lot of frontline workers. And so I, I was kind of. Uh, struck by the juxtaposition that our business felt more uncertain than it had at any point in its history. You know, literally there was a point where Amazon and Target were like, we can't even buy your product from you right now because we've got to use all of our capacity towards essential goods. Um, and so, but, but there was more need for giving than probably at any point in our company's history. And one of the most, we, one of the most significant things I think we've done in the company's history is that we really chose to lean in to giving during that period. So we did uh, what we called was like a bottles for heroes campaign. We gave away a million dollars worth of bottles to frontline workers across the country. We, we had a 30 days of giving thing where we gave cash donations to important charities that were helping people in need for, for 30 days. And, and basically at a point where the future felt the most uncertain, we really leaned into giving because the need was the greatest. And so for me, it's been said that your company culture, you know, and, and your company values aren't necessarily what you write on a piece of paper or what we put on the sleeve of our product, but they're the choices you make when it costs you something, you know? And I think that that was, for me, that was kind of a litmus test of, hey, this really is a company that's built on generosity. We're not just telling that to ourselves, but it really is true. So we try to focus our giving in a few different areas, um, education. Uh, underprivileged or marginalized communities, uh, human trafficking, clean drinking water uh, are, are really kind of some of the main areas. So some of the great partners that we have, we partner with people both locally and nationally. Um, a, a couple of great local partners we have are Water4, who's doing amazing stuff in kind of social entrepreneurship with clean drinking water in Africa. Um, and Restore OKC, who is doing an amazing job of serving some of the um, the underprivileged parts of, of Oklahoma City, and we were able to help fund and build a greenhouse with them. It's providing, you know, quality, nutritious food in, in an area that's a food desert of OKC. And so, 
uh, and we've done quite a few different things with them. But anyway, those are examples of some of the ways that we're we're funneling the giving. But I do think overall, it's just an attitude of not that the company exists to make us money, mm -hmm. but that we're stewards mm -hmm. and that it's our responsibility to, to take the success of the company and to be generous with it and, and to, you know, to hold it with open hands, not like this is mine. I, I, you know, this is mine to hold on to, but you know, whatever, whatever success we have that we then say, okay, how do we, how do we give this back and how do we, um, you know, lean into generosity with this. Mike, it's so refreshing this morning to hear your take on your take on business. You know, I know part of I know part of your model, uh, but I would imagine that's I here. I would imagine for our student, a few of our students, it might be eye opening to hear what you just said. You know that you know that the, the, I think there's a there's a thought that that businesses exist just to make money, and I love that the first you obviously are you're you're making a lot of money, but I love that you keep at the forefront that you exist to give generously. I can only imagine that that may raise an eyebrow or two uh, as team members, you know, potential team members are looking to be a part of Simply Modern. Yeah, I, I think I think a couple of things we're saying there. One is that it certainly helps you to recruit for a particular culture, you know, and I, I don't think about our culture with Simple Modern as the best or the right culture. I, I'm not really that type of a thinker, um, but it's distinct and it's our culture and we believe in it. And um, so we have an attitude that we are happy to be kind of heterogeneous or diverse in, in background and gender and thought process and all kinds of stuff, but homogeneous on values. Like you, you, you don't want diversity when it comes to values. That's actually destructive organizationally. And so when you say, hey, like, this is what we're about, you know, like not everybody needs to be about this and we're not even saying this is best, but this is what we are about. This is where we're gonna plant our flag. It makes it a lot easier to find the people that you really need to be a part of your team. And, and especially when you're, you've got a mission like us, um, it, it really helps you to, to select out the, the right type of team members. One other thing that I think is worth saying, you know, because I do work with, and I, I know that the people listening to this are, are aspiring entrepreneurs, is that I do think there's more of a, a hunger for this thought process than ever before, that businesses should have an impact. And they, they you know, when I, I, I just naturally, when I talk to college students, like, this is the way they think, like, what are the causes that we want to give to with our business? Uh, whereas that might have been a pretty foreign idea even 20 years ago. But one thing that I that I tell students, and it's important for everybody to hear this, people will not initially buy from you because of um, your generosity or your giving, or at least that's been our experience. Mm -hmm. You know, initially you have to win on the quality of your product and your value proposition. What what tends to happen is that you know we we win because we have uh, a premium, amazing quality product at really affordable prices. And then what happens is people buy that, they love it, and then they say, I want to know more about this company. And they start to, to go down the rabbit hole a little bit, and, and then they become kind of lifelong fans. Mm -hmm. And so so the, the miss that I'll see sometimes is this idea that if my company is about the right things, that's what will make it successful. And I think that, you know, good intentions and a desire to give aren't enough in and of themselves to get a venture off the ground, but they certainly become um, a huge uh, differentiator as you grow the company, as you do start to get customers and, and they start to learn what you're about. Um, it's a game changer. So it has to be both. You know, you have to be a good operator and you have to, you know, do the fundamentals of starting uh, a good business, a, a, a good heart isn't enough to get traction and product market fit is what I've learned. But then it makes a tremendous difference once you get to the point where you really are building a brand. Yeah. No, that was so evident uh, what you just said, Mike. I was scrolling through your thousands of five-star reviews on Amazon. And I think you, I really, I think you catch the vibe that I caught is I think you catch customers by surprise, by the quality, you know, of, of the product, its durability, and then hopefully then that leads individuals to be able to check out to see what Simply Modern is really about. And it's more than just a water, water bottle. And I really, really admire the company and you and your leadership and your team for that. Mike, you are, 
I, I feed off of you in, in a lot of ways, but one in particular is that it's very evident that you love what you do. Um, you love life. And unfortunately, not a lot of uh, young adults, you know, older professionals can really say that, you know, about the thing that they do. So I just wanted to ask you, if you had to narrow it down to one thing, what is it about the thing that you do today that you love the most? Well, you know, one of the things that happens when you start a company is, and this is this is both an opportunity and a challenge, is that the ground moves under your feet. It's not really the same job. You know, like if you if you take over being the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, it's probably pretty much the same job from the beginning to end. But when you start a company, what you end up doing, it's it's a little bit like being a parent, honestly. Like when you when you have kids being a good parent, you know, of an infant is very different than being a good parent of a five-year-old, which is very different than being a good parent of a nine-year-old. Like your kid just has different needs and ways they need to be cared for. And that's the way it is, you know, running a company is that you have this growing thing that at different stages needed you to be a different person. One example of that is in the earliest days of a venture, you know, really it's about your ability to execute and your bias to action and your hustle and you know just like commitment these things really matter your ability to kind of do the blocking and tackling of running the business um and certainly i was doing a ton of that in the early days of simple modern and i loved it you know it was really fun like i just enjoy e-commerce but as the company grows there you get to be a point and i think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with this where your company reaches a size where if you're doing the blocking and tackling, you're now actually probably a net negative, even if you're really effective at it. Because what starts to happen is you need to be training and empowering these new people you're bringing to the team and creating you know, future leaders. But if you're not creating kind of the opportunity or the space for that to happen, then people will start to stagnate. And so the way that my job has evolved most recently, and one of the things that I'm really passionate about is that now I'm more of a multiplier. You know, now I really am not an executor anymore. And there are days where that's hard for me. There's days where it's like, man, all I did today was talk to people. What did I get done? But my job is empowering others, pouring into others, helping others level up, and that's really exciting. You know, when you feel like when when you feel like you're helping enrich other people's lives and helping them get to places that they couldn't have gotten by themselves, you know, that's really a, a lot of ministry is about that. Uh, and I think that that's an aspect of my job today that, that I love doing. Mm, absolutely love that, Mike. And that's a hard thing to do uh, as a as a business owner, as a leader, as an executive, as a president, CEO of a company, it's to be able to step back from that tackling and uh, and that blocking, like you've referenced. So you're speaking you're speaking to me right now, Mike. <laughs> we, you know, there, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking it, and yeah. I think that that's been the rest. You know, for me, that's been the personal growth I've gotten out of the last year is that challenge of you know once you become competent as a certain type of leader in a small venture then you know the cheese moves and the venture grows and now you need to be competent in a different way and i'm sure that even you know this phase i will look back on this phase you know as the company continues to grow so um that that's that's been a really encouraging part you know at different parts points in the journey i've loved different parts like there's a part of me that just loves creating things you know like we get to make just beautiful you know like really creative stuff and like that's so fun one one thing that was been really fun about the company is that and we we got into kids drinkware which has been a huge success for us uh, and a lot of it's been designing things for my kids you know like what do you guys like what are you know where are you at and that's really fun. You know, it'll be like, I'm designing products for my life and like where I'm at and where my family's, where my family's at. So anyway. Doe, thanks for adding that part. And and maybe you're going to go there in this next question, but want to hear, is there a, is there a current dream, you know, right now that you are working on that you could share with our audience? Well, you know, I, I, I think that that's one of the things I'm kind of constantly wrestling with is, as our reach and our influence is expanding, how do we use wisdom about how to use that is certainly one of them. I mean, I think, I think that 
there is this overriding principle of I want to be someone who is generous with everything that I've got, the knowledge about how to run companies, resources, you know, uh, whatever else. And so that's part of why I'm, I'm teaching at OU um, in addition to, to running a company and, and trying to be a good, a good parent and spouse. But, you know, it's, it's a challenging question. And it's honestly, Michael, I think it's one that I'm continuing to kind of evolve on my understanding of it. Um, I mean, I do think it starts with, like I said, kind of generosity and empowering others. But I think how that looks um, is something that I'm still that I'm still kind of working through and unlocking as the company grows. And one, one of the things that I told my team, you know, this was a, a big insight for me, is that when you run a consumer brand, um, you you have more of a kind of a influence with with not just your customers, but the world in general. Um, you know, like if we were making screwdrivers, like that'd be fine, but you, you're, you know, you're probably not influencing how people think at all, but there are, you know, when you think about Nike, Nike influences how people think, you know, like it, it's interesting how we interact with consumer brands. And so one of the things that I, I told our team that I realized was that, you know, we're not building an ATM machine here. It, it's really more like a microphone. Mm-hmm. And that was insightful when I realized that, that like what we've been building is kind of a microphone and that an opportunity to amplify a perspective or, or thoughts on the world. And so hopefully uh, the way that we will use that will be one of encouraging generosity, encouraging healthy culture, encouraging empowering other people. Um, and, and, and some of these distinctives about the way that we think about the world and our values and our mission, we'll be able to, 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 you know, broadcast those to the world. And hopefully those make an impact on how other people think and, and we're part of positive change. So it's somewhere in there, you know, uh, it is, it's probably uh, other than just like, you know, I have, a, I have goals and dreams to be the best father that I can be and best friend and spouse that I can be. Mike, I love what you said of, you know, the perspective of a, a business being a microphone versus an ATM, that it's not just, you know, an exchange of money, but rather a, a way to lift up a message. And, I, you know, you mentioned it earlier that students are kind of coming in now with a different perspective on business, too, with, you know, perhaps one of their first and foremost things might be, you know, it's a charity that we can give to. Um, and I, I notice this a lot in our middle school students, our high school students, their perspective is definitely shifting towards, you know, how can I help people with my business? Um, but if you could go back to say to your middle school self, or maybe even talk to our middle school students directly, you know, what's a piece of advice that you would want to give to them? Well, yeah, you know, our, our company has a few values and one of them uh, is growth mindset, which growth mindset is just the the belief that your your talents and abilities are not fixed, they're not static, um, that they can be grown and and developed. Now it it's often difficult and challenging and and sometimes painful, but it can be done. Um, and I think that I wish I had had more of a growth mindset earlier than I did. Now when I get kind of feedback from my peers, it's that um, I'm, I'm maybe, the, you know, I'm very growth mindset oriented, but uh, I don't think I was that way in high school uh, or college. Uh, I think that there was much more of a sense of kind of like, what do I need to do, you know, to kind of check the boxes or to get the grades or, you know, whatever. And uh, what I realize now is that the person I was really cheating was myself, you know, mm-hmm you have to take responsibility for your own development. No one else um, can or will take responsibility. Your ceiling is dictated by you and by your desire to push yourself and learn and, and to grow. And so that would be my advice is that develop at an early age, an appreciation for learning for learning's sake mm-hmm. and a willingness to push yourself you know, there's a really simple uh, illustration of this. If you think about kind of growth rates, if my knowledge base grows 5% a year, that, that compounds over time. Mm-hmm. And what that means is that uh, if, if I'm growing at 5% a year, maybe, you know, whatever, 10 or 15 years from now, my, my total knowledge base is 
three times uh, what it is today. But if it's growing at 10% a year, it might be eight times what it is today in 10 years. And there's a way that like every additional day that you push yourself, that will compound. And when you do that for a few years or a couple of decades, you look up and you realize you're just in a dramatically different place than you were before. Um, and I think I've seen that. I've seen that with peers of mine that took some more safe routes out of college and they feel like they've stagnated some because they haven't been challenged to grow and they didn't put systems in place to challenge themselves. And, you know, conversely, I certainly feel like there are shelves that I can kind of intellectually reach now that I just couldn't even two or three years ago, you know, as a leader, um, as, a, as a business thinker, as a strategist, you know, and, and that's a result of continuing to push myself. One, one example with the growth mindset, you know, I, I'm typically somebody who things, learning things is easier for me than most people. But there are, an except, there are a couple of exceptions, music and language. I'm just terrible. I mean, like, I'm, 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 object, I'm objectively bad. I'm not, not being modest here. Like, I'm, I'm objectively bad at these things. And I'm um, objectively below average. Um, and we do a lot of business with um, partners in China. And I just, a couple, uh, I guess this was a couple of years ago. I thought, you know, Mandarin is like one of the top two or three most difficult languages. We're doing all this business with Chinese partners. I want to I wanna at least learn some Mandarin. And, and I mean, I'm just so bad at learning languages. It's so hard for me. It'd be so easy to just be like, oh, I'm American. They'll kind of, they speak English. I don't need to do this. And I kind of decided like, I'm going to do it not because, you know, not because it's easy, but exactly because it is hard. Um, and was able to learn enough to kind of go and give a couple minute speech in, in, at a banquet that we did. And, um, you know, I'm sure I butchered everything. But <laughs> the process of saying, like, I am going to take this on. I, I could easily not do it, but I'm going to take it on and I'm going to push myself. Like, that's what growth mindset people do mm. is that they don't run away from the opportunities to push themselves. And, you know, like I said at the beginning of this, over the course of your life, what you start to realize is you might have teachers and coaches for short periods of time, but ultimately the only person that's going to really hold you accountable or help you to grow is yourself. And so, um, so anyway, I, that's, that's probably the biggest advice I'd give is have a growth mindset and challenge yourself, become the person who challenge, you know, get more challenge from yourself than from anyone else. Uh, and if you do, you'll, you'll look up as you get to, you know, 30, 40, 50, whatever, uh, and realize that, you know, the amount that you've grown is tremendous, even if it, it, it seems slow at the time. It's also, as a side note, it's one of the reasons why startups are so great. Startups are this environment where you just get pressed on in so many different ways that you have to grow so quickly. And it is really challenging. It's really stretching. But you look up after five or 10 years of being in startups, and it's just amazing the amount that you've learned and the number of skills and abilities you've developed. Mike, thanks for sharing that advice. Definitely advice, not just for our students, of course, that are listening, but viewers of any age. The, growth, the idea and thought of growth mindset is, is so powerful. So thank you for letting us in just a little bit, just on the side also too of your, of your professional development. Mike, we're beginning to wind down. So we're gonna give you just a quick break to perhaps take in a couple more ounces of water. Carolyn and I are gonna do a quick recap uh, of a couple of our favorite parts of the interview, which is gonna be hard to do. And then we're gonna bring you back for a couple of questions, okay? Sounds great, Michael. All right, we'll see you back. Carolyn, you might have to pass on some musical uh, teaching. <laughs> that, uh, I, I could possibly do that. Uh, <laughs> Michael, this was such a great interview. It's, it, it is truly hard to, to pick, on, pick on one thing um, that I really enjoyed. There were a couple things that I would say really stood out. Um, see, I told you I couldn't just pick one. Um, <laughs> one, one being the uh, the values part of it. Um, and Mike said, choices that we make when it costs something. Um, that's a real example of living out your values. 
And I thought that was huge, like on a personal level, um, of course, organizationally, but also personally, like it's not just, you know, I'm a, a, a good person that likes to go do good things, but it's actually the things that we do, not when it's convenient, um, not when it's easier, when we're going to get accolades for it, when we're going to get a pat on the back, but rather because it costs us something because it is a sacrifice that that's really, truly living out your values. Oh, I like that. I, I, I felt like like during the interview that Mike was laying out, I don't know if one of his dreams one day perhaps would be to write a book, but I, I felt the most different parts of chapters that he just laid out for us. And a lot that he shared about just the, about his journey and the building of a business is not necessarily something that you're gonna find on the shelves uh, in a book at Barnes and Noble or on Amazon. Uh, because a lot of the things that he's doing is unconventional. Uh, and I just love the idea. I mean, everything ranging from, you know, why his company exists uh, to the type of culture that he's building at Simply Modern, but ultimately the type of the kind of message uh, that he's sending to the to, to the world and he's passing on to the world. And uh, I can only be encouraged, you know, with our students being given the opportunity to be able to glean from Mike today. And I know, Carolyn, we already have a couple of comments and questions that have come in. So if you're okay, we'll bring Mike back and we'll launch into our first one. Let's do it. Okay. Mike, just taking some water? Yes, got a, got a refill, I'm good. All right, all right. <laughs> well, let's start out with our first question. And this is actually through our website, loveworksleadership.org, where our, our listeners or those that are interested in the podcast have a chance to ask our dreamer and doer a question. And so, Mike, this comes from a young entrepreneur that's part of LoveWorks. Her name is Hannah. So, Hannah, take us away with the first question. Hello, my name is Hannah, and I am 12 years old. I'm an entrepreneur at heart, and I have started two businesses. My big dream is still in process, but I know I want to be an author. My question for Mike is, what was your dream in middle school, and are you living your dream now? So... Okay, uh, it, probably the closest thing I had to a dream in middle school was being an NBA basketball player. And as, <laughs> as you can clearly see, that did not happen. Uh, I, I did not realize that uh, I had neither the height nor the athleticism to, to really be a, an NBA basketball player. Uh, but, you know, I think in some ways it's, it's – been a good experience and from an entrepreneurship perspective that really entrepreneurship is kind of this combination of having hopes and aspirations and getting feedback and being flexible you know i really that that's that's kind of at the heart of what makes successful entrepreneurs is this kind of uh, dynamic uh kind of call and response that you do is you're you're getting information from the market and you're adapting and adjusting and so um i think i think that uh going through having a dream early on that was that was unrealistic and then kind of understanding more what my strengths and abilities were and then and then adjusting that was actually good and it's probably a piece of advice i'd give is that you know the, the time that you're the most in danger as an entrepreneur is when you get tunnel vision and you really think one answer has to be the um, and, and then you can start um, kind of pounding your head against a wall sometimes instead of walking through an open door that's, you know, five feet to your right. And so the, the biggest advice I would give is I think having dreams about the values you want your life to be about, uh, about the environment you want to be a part of, the legacy that you want to leave, um, those are really great. And I would encourage those. And then I would get less um, I'd be less specific on the exact kind of manifestation of that, um, that I want to make this exact type of product or I need to be in this exact um, kind of profession. Uh, one of the things I wrote a, a blog post recently where I talked about how, you know, persistence is something that we know is important to entrepreneurs. But it's actually a particular type of persistence. If you think about persistence, there's kind of sometimes there's there can be toxic persistence in our life where we have a dream that we keep pursuing, even though it's not really a good dream for us to be pursuing. And, you know, what's the difference between something being kind of toxic persistence and being really redemptive persistence? What I pretty much come up with is it's how how flexible and open handed we are 
with kind of how that um, the specifics. And so like an example I give is um, there have been a lot of people that are like, I want to be in music and I'm going to be a singer. I'm going to be a recording artist. And they spend years or decades chasing that and, and, and aren't able to get anywhere. And then there's scores of other people who are just like, I'm passionate about music. I'd love to be a singer. But if that doesn't work out, I'm happy to be a songwriter or, you know, a um, run a recording studio or any, you know, be, be a publicist or a marketing because I just love music. And so that's more of the attitude that I'd encourage people to have when you're thinking about your dreams is that you're open handed with kind of more of the specifics, but certainly like a, at a kind of a values level and a, a uh, uh, yeah, values and an environment level that you you have more specific opinions. I like that. Um, we have a special message from Uganda first before I jump into the next question. This is from Robert Bob Okello. He just mentions that you were his mentor in NVD at OU and is a true honor. And so he says, thanks, Mike, and much love from Uganda. Uh, so super cool. Bob oh, hey, good cool. to see you, man. <laughs> Bob was one of our former, also a former podcast guest. So very cool. We got a, yeah, another. He was, in a, he was in my class during the semester that got blown up by coronavirus, I believe. And so <laughs> he was here and then he had to leave like during the school semester. So uh, kind of a crazy, a crazy time. It's good to hear from you. Good. We got a question for you from Karen and she asked, how do you select the nonprofits that you give to? So we, in general, uh, kind of specified areas uh, of focus that we wanted to hit. And that was a good starting point. I mean, there's so much need, right? Like there's just, there's so many good causes. There's so much need. Um, and so I think you start by saying, you know, you, you, can't, you can't do everything. And so what are some areas of focus that you want to have? And as I mentioned, we have a few areas of focus. And then the second thing for us is we really wanted to find some local partners if we could. Um, and so we do have some national partners as well, but you know, we want to have some local partners. If there's, if there's a local partner in an area of focus, who's doing a really good job, we want to, we want to talk to them. Um, so like right now, recently we've been looking at human trafficking and we've been trying to find like what's the right partner or partners for us in, in that area. And we've talked to some people both both here and in other parts of the country that are really doing some amazing work. Um, so that that's kind of been our process. But you know, it's also just be open to talking to anyone because you know we've come across a, some opportunities that we've been really excited to partner with um, that we would have never found on our own. So I think it's both. You know, it's like there's an openness to talking um, to anyone. Um, but then there's also like some deliberateness about where you want to focus and, and trying to uh, find organizations where you can really relationally connect and partner with them as well. You know, because you, you really don't want it to be where you're just writing checks. Um, mm -hmm. It's not bad, but it's not ideal. So like one of the things that we do, uh, we started doing last year is we do this giving summit where we have a bunch of our partners come to our office and present and we spend time with them. And uh, that's a huge highlight for our team. One other thing that's worth mentioning, the way that we do our giving budget, this is another thing that's just atypical, probably 30% of our 30 or 40% of our giving budget, we divide up among employees. So there's a very good chance that for our 2021 giving that every employee at the company is going to be able to say, hey, I want to give $10,000 to X. And they're going to be able to kind of self-direct it which is pretty exciting. Yeah. You guys hear this? I've got a, for Christmas, I got one of these robot vacuums and it's on the <laughs> And it is like at the door, like let me in, wandering around the house. So if you hear, <laughs> you hear some background noise, it's just, just my robot vacuum. Uh, oh, great. It's a great, uh, great sound machine, right? Mike, we just have one more question. And thanks for just being so generous with your time today on the podcast. This one's from Brian. And he said that running a business can be challenging. And what is an obstacle that you faced in business? And how did you overcome it? Well, I, I think the biggest, and there's, there's two, um, you know, business is problem solving, really. And so if you don't like problem solving, you ain't gonna like business much, you know, and it's good, just good for people to know that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the two most difficult problems are uh, people problems and dealing with failure. 
you know, which in a lot of ways is just dealing with your own issues and your own insecurities and junk. And so I, I would say that's really, for me, that's all, all the, the toughest things have been managing myself and um, making sure that I manage the relationships of the people that I'm working with the, the way that I want to. Um, I mean, there's plenty of stuff that goes wrong. You know, I can name tons of things that have kind of gone wrong over the years that we've had to deal with. Um, but they end up not being that big of a deal uh, in the long run. Uh, is what I found. But uh, how do you deal with, you know, big setbacks, big disappointments? Um, how do you deal with conflict? Um, how do you deal with team members who are not aligned? Like, these are the things that end up being the most challenging and the most draining. Um, and so uh, we have an incredibly high emphasis uh, with Simple Modern on culture and team and communication and connectedness. Um, and uh, like I said, on the failure thing, I've written on my blog uh, a few things about about failure and, and what I've learned from that. I, I've been fortunate that I've had probably less, I've had to deal with failure less than a lot of entrepreneurs, but um, probably the most helpful informative thing that happened in my career was a massive failure of a, a business that my brother and I tried to launch just a couple of years ago. So um, that's, that's probably what I'd answer is a lot of it is about managing yourself. And it's less, you know, we, we, we can tend to think that our lives are dictated by our circumstances, but they're usually not. It's, it's less about what happens to you and more about how you react to what happens to you. Well, Mike, before we send you off, we just want to give you an opportunity. We already mentioned, of course, where we can, our listeners can purchase Simply Modern products, but uh, anything in particular that you can give a shout out to in regard to Simply Modern and or you referenced your blog and we'll, yep. of course, all of this into the show notes, but how can we find Mike Beckham? The, the two best ways, um, you, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. You can follow, follow me on Twitter. It's at Mike Beckham OU. I'm just starting to kind of um, actually invest some time there. And then uh, my blog is just MikeBeckhamBlog.com. Um, and I'm starting to write about the things that I've learned, you know, again, with this idea of, you know, trying to give away whatever I've learned that's helpful. I want to give it away and share it with other people. So those are probably the best uh, things for me. You can learn more about us by going to our website and going to the about us section and you know, watching the video. And uh, we're, we're obviously really appreciative for anybody who's a part of our um, success and journey of Simple Modern. Awesome. Well, all that and more will be in the show notes. Mike, we cannot thank you enough. We've been looking forward for a long time to get you on the podcast. And I think so appropriate. We get to celebrate number 50 with Mike Beckham uh, from Oklahoma, which I think is super awesome. So thanks for helping to make us better today. Well, thanks for having me on. It's been great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, we'll see you, Mike. Mike. Carolyn, number 50 delivered. It's pretty stinking awesome. <laughs> I think I think beneficial for um, for me to hear as someone who um, you know is a part of a business, of course, as well. Um, but even in, in a personal life aspect, you know, uh, really refreshing thoughts on on business overall. It makes me feel better as a consumer to know that there are people out there like Mike um, who are doing business with excellence. So really cool. Well, as we bring this to a close, we always like to remind you, if you're looking for all things LoveWorks Leadership, check us out at loveworksleadership.org. That's where you can find our previous uh, 49 episodes of Dreamers and Doers, along with our blog and various programs here that we're doing with students around the world. And we always like to remind you to set your calendars for next Monday. We're going to be bringing in someone by the name of Renee Adams. And Renee is a children's book author, and she's also the founder and owner of Calm in Your Palm, Hoppy and Poppy Pink Cheeks. Uh, and learnandlove.eq is another uh, organization that she started. So they're great brands that are going to help to teach families about emotional intelligence and students, something that I know that I'm excited just for you to uh, just have just unlocked with Renee and one of the experts in the field. For sure. It's going to be super cute and uh, super beneficial. I know that for sure. Um, just a reminder, of course, to visit LoveWorks Leadership for all of our digital resources. Um, they are out there. We even have our contact information. And so if you have someone that you think, hey, you should interview this person or you are that person themselves, um, reach out to us. Our information is definitely out there. And remember, everybody, that real leaders, they don't blend in, but they stand out.
Dream big. And do your dreams.